This year of 2020 has been a very stressful year. Unfortunately, we can't hit a restart button and decide to do all over again. We can't have a do-over, as uh, some people might say, and just try to run this year over once again. Uh, we have to continue with where we are. This year has brought multiple issues that create stress. In addition to the crazy partisan politics that always seem to divide our nation, our country has been grappling with the issues of pre police brutality, racial tensions, demonstrations calling for justice and change uh, across many major cities in the United States. And with all this turmoil, those inclined to break the law have been hard at work. Uh, maybe some of you have noticed all the looting uh, and fires that took place in connection with some of the demonstrations. And also just recently on the news, I saw a report on the number of fraudulent uh, requests for unemployment that have uh, gone in. Uh, then anyway, so there always seems to be a fringe element to, ready to break the law given any new opportunity. Throw in a pandemic like COVID-19 that health authorities don't fully understand, and we have a very toxic, stressful environment in which we're living. It can wear out the most resilient of us trying to make sense and navigate these troubled waters. Many of us probably feel a bit worn down and worn out with all of these things occurring. And speaking of this being worn out, I'd like to take you to somewhat of a unique passage in the Old Testament. I'd like to take a look at an Old Testament, Hapex Legomenon. Some of you may recall, I've used this term a time or two before, a Hapex Legomenon is a Greek phrase meaning a single occurrence of a word within a text. Uh, the Encyclopedia Judaica article, Hapex Legomena, says that there are about 1,300 of these in biblical Hebrew, and most of them are easily understood and translated. And actually, there are over 686 Hapex Legomena in the New Testament, so there are some of these. But the place I'd like to go is the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 is a chapter in which we see an overview of governments, uh, four major world ruling governments that were going to exist. Uh, there were a couple of different dreams. Nebuchadnezzar had one of these that Daniel interpreted. Daniel also had one himself that uh, confirmed the same four world ruling empires. And after explaining that these were going to come about, he began speaking about this fourth kingdom that was going to arise. We know of it as the, the Roman Empire with 10 different revivals down through history. And speaking of this fourth beast, uh, we come to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. And it says, he, uh, speaking of uh, this particular kingdom, this fourth kingdom, and uh, uh, it says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. And then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. This is a time of persecution of the saints, and it's rather interesting, the New King James that I, I've read to you here, to persecute the saints, it reads a little differently in the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. This new King James translation of persecute, and this is that word persecute is the uh, unique word that is used here, the hapex uh, legomenon, and uh, the New King James says persecute instead of wear out, but persecute really is too general a translation and doesn't capture the full meaning that is involved here. 
The word is listed in Strong's Concordance as Hebrew word number 1080, but as the New American Standard Exhaustive Concordance notes, it is actually an Aramaic word found only this one time in the Bible. And the word is Bela, and it means to wear away or wear out. And Strong's Concordance adds that this word is used in a mental sense. Now, Brown Driver Briggs adds that the word is figurative for harass continually. And there are several other biblical translations that translate this word persecute as to wear out the saints. You can check the American Standard Version, English Standard Version, International Standard Version, and Jewish Publication Society that all translate it this way as wear out or wear down. And so looking at this particular verse in verse 25, what it means is that this Roman Empire and the societal values that it projects are going to be mentally wearing on God's people. And while the end time existence of this empire may not yet be fully formed, the effects of our misguided society around us can likewise wear us down. God's people can be worn down. <clears throat> so what can we do to avoid being worn out and worn down by the world, uh, by the issues that are extant today, by the virus the, that is unseen but haunting and out there that we all have to make judgments and decisions regarding? One answer to how we can avoid being worn down is found in keeping the weekly Sabbath. And today I want to focus on the weekly, on weekly Sabbath observance as a spiritual tool for maintaining our sanity and stability during times of stress. And so my title for today's message is The Weekly Sabbath, A Day of Refreshing. You know, I've given many sermons through the years on the subject of the Sabbath, and those of you sitting in this room have probably heard many sermons on the Sabbath as well. I always like to try to find a fresh way to approach a subject that I've known about and perhaps that you've heard about many times as well. And sometimes we look through a lens from a slightly different perspective. We see things in a slightly different way or with a fresh perspective. And so today I want to do that and from with the focus on the Sabbath being a time of refreshing. So as we begin looking at the Sabbath through this lens of as a day of refreshing, let me begin by noting that the weekly Sabbath is a type of the coming millennium which is a time of refreshing. Let's go to Acts chapter 3 and verses 18 through 21. This is a passage that we often read around the fall holy days, in particular the Feast of Tabernacles. It is, we often read it in connection with that uh, particular time period. And let's notice it again in Acts chapter 3 beginning verse 18. Uh, Peter is speaking here, says, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Verse 19, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Continuing here in Acts 3, now verse 20, That he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The thousand-year reign of Christ on earth is going to be a time for restoring the earth to the state it was when Adam and Eve were created and placed in the garden. God's law will be the law of the land. There will be justice and peace and abundant prosperity, there won't be pandemics, and the economy will be stable. There will be opportunity for all to live good physical lives, and even more important, receive spiritual salvation. This kind of society won't wear anyone down. It'll, it'll be a joy to be a part of this society. It'll be a refreshing change 
from this present evil age. There's long been a connection of the weekly Sabbath to the coming millennium for the people of God. Edward Gibbon, in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, in his chapter in which he documented early Christianity, cited the belief of the early Christians that mankind has been allotted 6,000 years to live as he pleases, and that following this, there'd be a thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth. And while the Bible doesn't specifically state that that's the way it's going to be, that human beings will only have 6,000 years, and then there'll be a millennium when Christ will return, it is a logical assumption that can be drawn from some biblical passages. For example, Psalm 90 and verse 4 says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. And then 2 Peter 3 and verse 8 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So logically, if we compare the that millennium to a weekly process, the thousand years, one day to God, we can easily see how 6,000 years could be allotted to mankind. And we are roughly, give or take, a number of years sort of at that point right now. But the connection and the correlation between the millennium and the weekly Sabbath is there. It's uh, a a subject, and it's a connection that has long been with us. And so, as we've reflected upon this time of refreshing that we read about here in a time of restoration in Acts chapter 3, uh, we see the connection between the millennium and the Sabbath. So, anyway, the, the point I wanted to make is, is verse 19 of Acts chapter 3, talks about a time of refreshing that is going to come. The weekly Sabbath, of course, is a time of refreshing that comes to us every seven days. But now let me spend the bulk of my time here in my sermon today sharing with you three ways that Sabbath observance can refresh us, that can help us find new energy, give us life once again, uh, stamina to continue on in our lives. So three ways that Sabbath observance refreshes us. The first way is the most obvious way I think most of us recognize from the very outset, and that is through physical rest, our bodies are refreshed. Through physical rest, our bodies are refreshed. When we go to Genesis chapter 2, let's turn there, we see the very first passage where we read about the Sabbath, and it was created by God uh, from the very beginning. In uh, Genesis chapter 2, and verses 1 through 3, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth, and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. When God rested here, he did not need physical rest, but he set an example for us that we human beings could rest, and we human beings do need rest. We grow tired, we grow weary. God does not. And it's kind of interesting that we human beings tend to have body clocks that work on about a seven-day rhythm. Uh, in science, it's called a circadian rhythm that we human beings seem to have wired within us. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 20. I'll say a little more, share a little bit more with you about that uh, these circadian rhythms in just a moment, but let's look at a couple more scriptures. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, where we read of, of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, and we'll begin reading in verse 8. It says, Remember the Sabbath day, Exodus 8, pardon me, Exodus 20, verse 8. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And so all that we have, our uh, family, our household, our servants, our employees, all deserve a rest and should have the opportunity to rest is what God is teaching us here. Now let's turn over now to Exodus chapter 23 and verse 12. And this is a continuation of the Sabbath, but I dare say we don't always read this particular uh, passage in connection with the Sabbath the commandment in Exodus chapter 20, but it adds something rather interesting for us to note here. In Exodus 23, in verse 12, it says, Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. There's that word refresh that we're focusing on today and the lens that we're looking at. And so we see physical rest as a means of being refreshed for those that work, for those that labor, uh, we human beings. So there's a refreshing uh, that comes about. Now let me go back to this concept I was telling you about how our human bodies seem to be wired on a seven-day pattern of circadian rhythm. I'd like to quote from Life, Hope, and Truth, an article, actually it is a discern article that was published in the May-June 2018 uh, issue of Discern Magazine, an article titled, Do You Need a Rest? by some obscure author named David Trabig. I'm going to plagiarize this guy to death, uh, so, but I've told you in advance, so you, you know what it is, but, uh, and you can check to make sure that I do it correctly. But the text talks about chronobiology. Uh, it says this is the branch of biology concerned with natural physiological rhythms and cyclical phenomena has found that we humans have internal biological clocks. Circadian rhythms are 24-hour circles that refer to our daily routines. We tend to do certain things at the same time every day. For example, with the possible exception of weekends, we generally get tired at a set time and wake up at a specific time each day. And surprising to many, our bodies also have seven-day cycles. In his book, Proof Positive, Neil Nedley, a medical doctor, writes, quote, just as the body has a natural daily clock, a circadian rhythm, it also has a weekly clock, a circa septum rhythm, body rhythms that run about seven days in length. Uh, continuing, he says, middle, medical research has demonstrated such rhythms in connection with a variety of physiological functions. Some that have been identified include heart rate, suicides, natural hormones in human breast milk, swelling after surgery, and rejection of transplanted organs, end quote. As for some of the more obvious seven-day cycles, it continues, weekly rhythms appear easiest to detect when the body is under stress, such as when it is defending itself against a virus, bacterium, or other harmful intruder. For example, cold symptoms, which are really signs of the body defended itself against the cold virus, last about a week. Chickenpox symptoms, a high fever and small red spots, usually appear almost exactly two weeks after exposure to the illness. Uh, end quote. That's from Susan Perry and Jim Dawson, The Secrets of Our Body, Our Body Clocks Reveal, uh, page 21. As an aside, have you noticed that people recovering from COVID-19 are told they must be symptom-free for 14 days before returning to work? 
Have you also noted that if someone is exposed to the virus, they're advised to self-quarantine for 14 days? Here's another example of these seven-day cycles that seem to be part of the way we are created. Going back to this obscure author, he wrote, since the rhythm of life for us humans includes circus septum cycles, we're faced with a number of intriguing questions. Are these seven-day cycles just a quirk of our existence, or are they the fingerprints of our Creator? And more specifically, does God have any instructions for us that harmonize with our body clocks and help us temper hurry sickness? The idea that we have to hurry about life in such a frenzy that we have a hard time uh, continuing. So does the day matter? Some recognize the benefits of resting one day in seven, but assume that it doesn't really matter which day of the week we choose to rest. That's the way some people interpret the data. After all, our circus septum cycles don't necessarily align with the seventh day a week. We can catch and end a seven-day cold on any day uh, through the week. So does it matter which day we rest and worship God. Muslims, of course, worship on Friday, Jews on Saturday, most professing Christians on Sunday. And this author argues that it actually does matter. It says that resting and worshiping God on Saturday, the seventh day of the week, has spiritual meanings that can't be found by resting on any other day of the week. And so, Then, there are three reasons listed uh, that the Bible reveals regarding observing the seventh-day Sabbath. Three of the reasons mentioned by the Bible. Three reasons resting on the seventh day of the week reminds us that God is our Creator and that He blessed and sanctified this day. The last part of the Sabbath command notes, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, Exodus 20, verse 11. This is the day God rested upon, and he sanctified no other day for this purpose. A third, a second reason, resting on this day, the seventh day, the Sabbath, reminds us that God is our deliverer. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, they had to work whenever their masters decreed. And in connection with the command to observe the Sabbath, the ancient Israelites were reminded, and remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day, Deuteronomy 5, verse 15. This day of rest reminded the ancient Israelites that God had delivered them from a situation in which they couldn't rest. Today, God is still delivering people, only now it's from the bondage of sin. And a a third reason for observing the Sabbath on Saturday anticipates our eternal rest with God. Decades after the death of Christ, the first century Christians were still observing this day. And after explaining that there's a future rest for the people of God, The author of the book of Hebrews notes in Hebrews 4, verse 9, in the Bible in basic English, quote, there is still a Sabbath keeping for the people of God, end quote. Friday doesn't have these meanings, neither does Sunday. Only Saturday has these rich spiritual meanings. And so what we've seen here, we've seen that Physical rest is one way that we are refreshed on the weekly Sabbath. All right, let's go to a second area now of how we can be refreshed. Our, a second way, our minds can be refreshed by observing the weekly Sabbath. Our minds can be refreshed via Bible study, prayer, and hearing God's Word. Let me take you to a scripture here in Exodus chapter 31. Showed you the interesting one in Exodus 23 about being refreshed, rest on the Sabbath in order to be refreshed. Let's go now to Exodus chapter 31 and verse 17. Exodus 31 and verse 17, 
we're going to look at another very interesting passage with a concept that is only found here in the Bible. Exodus 31, verse 17. And some of you will recognize that Exodus 31 is a chapter about the Sabbath uh, being a covenant, a sign between God and his people uh, throughout the generations, uh, as verse 13 puts it. And therefore, the Sabbath is to be kept. Whoever profanes it was to be put to death. And someone that doesn't keep it was to be cut off from Israel. But verse 17, let's notice, it, speaking of the Sabbath, is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Interesting. God was refreshed is what it says here. I think it's only logical for us to conclude that this was in the mental sense as opposed to being tired. God does not grow weary. God does not grow tired. And what this word was refreshed means literally is to take breath. So as Barnes notes puts it, he says, he took breath, the application of this word to the creator, which occurs nowhere else is remarkable. So it was an opportunity for God to catch his breath. And not because he was tired, but it gave him a, a mental uh, opportunity to focus on something else, to think about something else. Uh, to take time to take a breath, to pause our nonstop lives, provides 24 hours for us to focus on the important things of life. This can be a refreshing, mentally uplifting, and stimulating time for us to think about the things that are most important. And where and how do we do this? How are we to be stimulated? One of the ways is the instruction that we're given in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, the chapter where we find the weekly Sabbath mentioned and the seven annual holy days. In Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 3, we read, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. What we see here is the holy convocation is part of the Sabbath. It's a major component of our spiritual refreshing. As we know, a convocation is an assembly, a public meeting of God's people. We also note that it is a holy convocation as opposed to just a regular type of convocation. It's not just a casual, come if it's convenient for you type of meeting. The Sabbath convocation is a meeting God has called us to attend in person. And I think that we all believe and understand that under normal circumstances, watching a webcast does not take the place of assembling in person with God's people. But today, with this pandemic, there are legitimate reasons for people not to attend. But even so, we need to remember that this current situation is temporary. And we all need to return to in-person services when it is safe to do so. We have to bear in mind that that is where we need to go. And want surely we all want to do that. And what do the scriptures say about the benefits of attending services in person? There's a passage in Nehemiah chapter 8. We're not given very many passages in the Bible that tell us how to conduct a church service, but Nehemiah chapter 8 is perhaps one of the best that we have. In Nehemiah chapter 8, let's read verses 1 through 11. This was during a time of uh, restoration and rebuilding after the Babylonian captivity of the Jewish people. 
Nehemiah 8, verse 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. This just happens to be one of God's annual holy convocations. Uh, we know this today as the Feast of Trumpets. So this was a holy day. It was a holy convocation. They were gathered together. Verse 3, and then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose and beside him at his right hand stood a number of different priests. You can see all the lists and the names here. Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benaiah, various ones and assistants that were involved there, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Sounds very much like what we strive to do today in our services, doesn't it? Verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God, do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. They had to be they were probably mourning because they realized they had not been obeying God and observing this day as they should have been. And they were told. Don't mourn. This is a day to rejoice, a day to be happy. Verse 11, so the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. Very interesting how the people noted there what they, the advice that they were given. And we see that verse 12, the response the people had was, and all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. Do we likewise rejoice over the things we learn and the concepts we're reminded of on, on the Sabbath? I hope we all do. I hope when the Sabbath day is over and we've attended a Sabbath service that there are things that have been pricked in our minds, either things that we've learned or new things for us to think about or new ways to look at things that reconfirm truths we've known for a long time over the years. My favorite time of the week is Sabbath after church service has concluded. I enjoy the fellowship, and usually Saturday evening is the occasion during the entire week that I feel most refreshed and at peace. And I hope you likewise find the mental refreshing that God wants us to have by observing the Sabbath every week. You know, there's another scripture that comes to mind as well about the benefit, the mental benefit of Sabbath services. And this is found over in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. I've gone here a couple of times recently, but it bears repeating. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. This passage tells us, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
attending Sabbath services and hearing God's word expounded and read and reviewed is a way that our faith is bolstered and strengthened every week. And what a, what a wonderful opportunity that is for us to have this mental refreshing of the important things of God and our relationship with God when we observe the Sabbath every week. A third way that we can be refreshed on the Sabbath is through fellowship with brethren. Our fellowship with brethren on the Sabbath is a type of refreshing for us. When the early Christians met and the church began, most of us aware are aware that there was quite a bit of fellowship that took place. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, for example, is one of these passages where we read of these early Christians uh, after the day of Pentecost and the New Testament church was getting started and being organized. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Fellowship was an important part of the early Christians' lives. And of course, that was something that they did in person. I don't think they had cell phones to uh, talk to one another on or uh, send text messages to, to one another. They probably could have written a letter. Letters were there, but uh, uh, obviously this seems to be an in-person a type of relationship that they had. Uh, we know that it was because they were eating food together. That's what breaking bread was. Uh, breaking bread was not taking communion, as some people uh, assume, mistakenly assume. In fact, if we skip down just a little bit to verse 46, we see, so con continuing daily with one accord and in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. This from house to house meant that they were in each other's homes. Uh, they were sharing their food with one another. They were sharing meals. They were spending time uh, with each other. Barnes notes on the Bible confirms that this passage means that they were in each other's homes and they were eating with one another, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts is the point of what they were involved in doing. There's also a, an interesting passage for us to think in terms of fellowship in 1 John, the first chapter in verse 3. What we find is, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3 is what we find is that this in-person fellowship with one another was an important part of, of the early church. And fellowship continues to be an important concept for us as well. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, John writes, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you and he's speaking of Jesus Christ, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John was talking about two concepts there, being called to this way of life is a calling to fellowship with brethren, and also with God, with God the Father and Jesus Christ. And what better day is there than the Sabbath when we assemble for services to have fellowship with God and with our brethren. Now, what about this concept of refreshing, uh, being with people in terms of fellowship? There are a couple of interesting scriptures I had not, I didn't realize that were here in the New Testament that I want to now share with you in regards to the refreshing that can come from fellowship and, and being with fellow believers. Let's go to Romans chapter 15 and verse 32. Romans chapter 15. And verse 32. Paul writes, That I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Part of what Paul... Uh, 
apparently was looking forward to and being with the brethren was to be refreshed together with them. That the brethren could be refreshed, that Paul could be refreshed, and it was something that would happen when they would be able to see one another and be together once again. That's the opportunity for refreshing that Paul was looking forward to. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 18. Paul again writing, and he said, he's speaking of verse 17. Let's back up one verse. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 17. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Far, uh, Fortunatus, and Achaeus, for what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge such men. Uh, we human beings have a part to play in refreshing others and encouraging other people, giving them a renewed energy and a, a peace of mind and a freshness, a, a, a joy and readiness to move on with life. Notice now 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse 13, therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, uh, Paul writes, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has, refer has been refreshed by you all. In this case, uh, Paul is writing to tell the brethren that Titus had been refreshed simply by being with the brethren in their presence. It was encouraging and uplifting for him to, to be with them. It was inspiring. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16. There are just a few passages where in the New Testament where we see this kind of wording, and so I thought it would be helpful to look at all uh, five of these that I have noted. Let's notice Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 16. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. We know that Paul was writing about this runaway slave, and this particular individual uh, brought joy and refreshing uh, to Paul, uh, apparently, when he was imprisoned. And Philemon, just over here again, one chapter long, Philemon, verse 7. Paul writes, for we have great joy and cons consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Paul is praising Philemon for his work and fellowship with others and the, the encouragement that he had given them. These passages that I've just shared with you speak of members being refreshed by the actions of ministers and of ministers being refreshed by the brethren. We have this opportunity for refreshing each other when we assemble on the Sabbath. We have the opportunity to encourage and inspire and uplift and, this, and while today we can do this with other devices that we have, uh, we can pick up the phone, we can text, uh, we, can, we can teleconference, we can even see people when we do things, but there's just something that is special about being in person to be able, able to do this in the presence of another individual. So what we've seen here today is that the weekly Sabbath is a day of rest from a restless world. And for God's people, the Sabbath continues to be a day of refreshing. And as we've seen, there are three ways Sabbath keeping can refresh us. One, through physical rest. Two, through mental refreshing with God and the things that we can learn about His way of life. And third, our fellowship with brethren. As a society around us wears us down, Let's be refreshed each week on God's Holy Sabbath Day.